फाइव एंड फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव यू कैन गो हेड प्रोसीड ओके well i want to thank everyone for coming tonight um and or this morning to our third uh session of iasds meeting you know when i got asked to sort of do the introduction and remarks i was um excited and privileged because i'm really just proud of of the this society we built this community we built and mostly because of our shared heritage and indian culture when we think of sort of when when we sat down and these founding members sort of came up with the idea of sort of creating the society i mean the mission and vision was really to create a community which when you look at what we've created is such an incredible community across oceans across many multiple plane rides to get there we've created this incredible collaborative community of what i would say amazing shoulder elbow surgeons and in our first two meetings i've had the privilege of learning from our indian colleagues from our american indian colleagues and i just am such a proud member to be part of this community and i think for us really this community in these meetings has gone beyond that and we've created traveling fellowships we've added um commu- uh what would uh, collaborative international members to the ases and and that kind of power and vision and mission really is so broad and ranging not only to build the community in india but here in the united states so as we kick off our third uh session and meeting you know i want to say that my thoughts are i just hope that we continue to build the membership build the momentum and build the community that has been so great and so visionary in terms of building a mission to create such a culturally diverse and united front so i'm so proud to be a shoulder elbow surgeon of indian descent and i'm proud to sort of introduce and launch our third uh i guess third meeting over the last two years that has been so successful virtually hopefully someday we will do it in person i hope so with that i think you know we are going to start with the open ladder jay talk is that right ram i think that's our plan yeah. Yeah. Um we have to congratulate Shri who put this together who uh fortunately has a beautiful new baby so he could not run this and uh manage this maybe as adept as we all would have hoped and so we as a community will come together to support him and make sure that the technical errors and snafus are sort of overlooked in the sense of bringing new babies in the world. <laughs> So I don't know who's giving who's giving our um open ladder J uh inter uh, okay. okay yeah so that'll be me so I'll just I'll just I'll just share my screen right now go ahead uh that's PowerPoint hmm. hold on a second here files advanced There we go. Okay, good. Can everyone see that? Yes, yes. all clear. Yes, yes, please. Great, good. Um, okay, so uh, my name's um, Fees. So I, I'm going to be take, taking a few minutes of time to talk about my. Um, so is it a, is it my background here? Hold on a sec. <laughs> I think it's showing up as my background. Uh, perfect. Um, You're good, Afiz. Go on. Oh, you can see it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So I'll be taking a few minutes talking about uh, kind of my thoughts uh, and opinions on an open ladder, Jay. Uh, a little bit, kind of talk about my indications and a little bit of what I think about and. And how how I approach it to try and make it a little bit easier. Um, so I think for me, um, before we start, I think it's important to know that I have a couple of disclaimers. Um, I think all shoulder and elbow surgeons should know how to do this procedure. 
but I think all shoulder and elbow surgeons should know how to do something else as well. Because I think that while it's been a workhorse for a long time in terms of dealing with uh, glenoid bone loss and anterior instability, um, there's been a lot of newer options uh, that have come around in terms of free bone block procedures, um, both autograft and allograft. Uh, and as the evidence for those has come out relatively, uh, you know, recently in terms of being supportive, um, I, I've actually reduced the number of ladder jays I've done in my practice over the last five years. And, and, I, and I wonder, and I would like to get everyone's opinions on this, on whether or not it's going to become a little bit more historical uh, in the future as we have different options available. Um, so so with, with that being said, I think, you know, my, my first real pearl is, is really understanding bone loss, primarily because that equates indications. I think, you know, geograph this may have some differences geographically, um, but, you know, for us and for me and, and most of us in North America, really, we, we try and categorize these things into broad categories of, you know, for the primary surgery, right, not a failed arthroscopic procedure, but for a primary indication, uh, if you've got less than 10% bone loss, most people are, are trending towards a soft tissue procedure. If it's more than 30%, you're, you're probably doing something else. And kind of if you're in that 10 to 30% bone loss range, you're thinking about doing a, a ladder day. So the question is, how do you come up with that number? So, so Brian Cole looked at, you know, has a really good review article looking at these different methods of bone loss calculation. And, and you know, they're, they're probably variable at best. And, and the, the, the methods that we all learn, you know, like the diameter method, uh, really, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's really only reliable at zero and 50% bone loss, which is not that helpful. And, it, and it's most unreliable at 20% bone loss, which is really unhelpful because that's really what you want to know. Cause that's really your midpoint of, of indication. So, you know, you've calculated that you decided you're going to do a ladder J, how do you do it? So for me, it really starts with positioning. So I'm, I'm really cautious about making sure that I have a bump under the medial border of the scapula. I think that extends the humerus so you can get a more uh, parallel shot and trajectory with your screws. And, and it can be uh, parallel to the glenoid face, which is important. And I, and I also think it's important to sit people up. So I do this beach chair and I've, and I've elevated people more and more over the years, because I think the more perpendicular they are to the floor, the more parallel your hands can get for, for an appropriate trajectory uh, to make sure that, that your screws are straight. Secondly, I, I, or thirdly, I think it's important to plan your incision. So these are kind of my three shoulder incisions that I use. The, the most lateral is kind of my arthroplasty incision. The most medial is the axillary fold incision, which I started with for uh, bone block procedures. But I've, I've actually moved to somewhere in the middle, primarily because I think it's easier to deal with uh, the subscap if, if you are unable to do it completely through a split and you have to mobilize it. Uh, and it may be a little bit more utilitarian uh, when you are, uh, you know, for future operations for, for revision or, or, or future arthroplasties if needed. So I think once you make your, your incision and you get down, it's really important to expose and understand your landmarks. So I take a little bit of time, I use irrigation, I take a sponge, I wipe out all the bursa to really understand what I'm looking at, to make sure that I can see the whole coracoid, I know where the coracoid ligament is, I know where the pec minor is, and I know where the conjoint tendon is. And the reason I do that is because I then measure everything. So there's been a good data coming out looking at average coracoid morphology. So while we know that there are some variabilities between people, there's there we can work within some generalities, right? So the average coracoid length is around 28 millimeters. Uh, your graft, you want it to be about two centimeters. So I typically measure it out to be about 22 or 23 millimeters to make sure that my osteotomy is long enough. So I have enough graft, but not too long where I might get into, get into the scapula and cause a fracture. Um, I measure the cuff, uh, the CA ligament cuff, because I do think it's important for um, uh, reinforcement of the capsule if you're going to do that. And I keep that at about a centimeter. And then once, once you harvest it, you know, what do you, what do you do with it? So for, for me, you know, there's a couple of iterations and, and methods on how you do it. I mean, the traditional approach of putting the coracoid flat. Um, and over the last few years, the, the transition to going to a more congruent arc, arch, arc approach. Um, I've, I've actually completely abandoned that. I really only do it uh, in the original uh, flat approach to it because I think they're, you're less likely to cause graft fracture. I think there's more surface area for the, for the bone block to heal. And I think if I'm not confident that I can get enough bone restoration with, uh, with the height, which averages around you know, 12 millimeters, then I'm probably doing something else. I'm not going to switch to a congruent arc. I think once you've, you know, once you've decided to do that, you, you decided to, to 
make your split and you're going to go, you're going to put it in. How do you, how do you do that? Right. So you really plan your split to being the, at the border between the top two thirds and the bottom third. And, you know, I make a horizontal split there uh, and I make sure that I can mark out my borders uh, of the subscap so that it's in the right position. I think while it's important to try and do it with a split, I, I think it's okay to take, to take it down. And, and particularly what we've learned from the uh, original subscap sparing arthroplasty. I mean, I think the most, most of us who do that now do it through the interval, but originally it was done through the bottom half of the subscap and, and it really heals. So I think if you can take down the bottom third, it really gives you great exposure uh, to see the glenoid. And I think it, while it's better to do it through a split, obviously, I, I don't think it's important enough to compromise position of your graft. So if you can't see it, I think it's important to you know, mobilize, your, mobilize your tendon and make sure that your graft is in the right spot. Once you've decided to, you know, you make your split, the next pearl I have is, is really making space. So I do spend time, I take a Cobb elevator, I delineate the layer between the capsule and the subscap. I put a sponge deep into it to create like a potential space so that I really can understand where the layers are so that I can then put my retractors appropriately. You know, you make your, your capsulotomy, you put your split, um, you put your ring retractor in the joint, and then you put retractor anteriorly so that you can really see what, see what you're doing. And you, and you can typically get very good exposure this way. And number nine, really it's all about location. I mean, making sure that your graft is really in that anterior inferior segment and that making sure that it doesn't overhang laterally into the joint, because I think as most of us who do arthroplasty know, one of the worst anatomics you can do is, is you know, arthritic ladder shape, because it's just a really, you know, difficult operation. So making sure that your graft is not Im impeding onto the joint and, and going to cause arthrosis. Um, it's probably a good time to talk about screw configuration. I mean, and this goes back and forth in terms of solid screws, partially threaded, fully threaded, cannulated. Um, I think the concerns of using a fully cannulated construct uh, in terms of being weak and, and causing or being susceptible to fracture, I think it's, it's a real concern, but it's also easier. So for me, what I do is I, I use a cannulated system uh, and I put the two pins in uh, for the superior hole. I put a cannulated partially threaded screw, which I tighten down about 80 to 90 percent of the way. That gives me some freedom to you know, window wipe the bottom half of the graph to make some micro adjustments. Then I hold it in place and then I take the pin out, drill it, and then put a full, full bodied screw at the bottom and then sequentially tighten to get compression. So essentially a hybrid construct. Uh, and that's what I, I've had some success with that. And thankfully haven't seen a fracture yet. And I think if you do that, you can pretty much get the x-rays, x-rays you want and getting graft in good position and getting your screws in the right place and making sure that the graft heals. And my final point is really making sure that you follow your patients. I mean, it's a complicated operation and failures happen. It, it's a, it, there is known um, complication rates with the procedure. And I think it's important to make sure that you recognize these early so you can fix them. I think if your graft is not healing, it's, it's not gonna stay. It eventually will break. Uh, so making sure that you understand that, you can see it, and then revising early may be a little bit better than waiting for, you know, for, for a catastrophe, which is very difficult to fix. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hafiz. Can you unshare your uh, screen, please? Yeah, I'm just doing it right now. Thank you. Hmm. The anterior instability session uh, is uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Anup Shah. Do you have any comments to make, Anup Shah, or entertain questions for Hafiz uh, talk? I would just like to thank um, Vani and Sri for inviting me uh, to be the moderator for this panel. Since Hafiz uh, you know, presented a really, really, really nice presentation on the top 10 pearls for the latter J. Um, what we'll do is we'll have Shirish and uh, maybe go ahead and present their cases. And after each of their cases, we'll have a small question and answer session um, just to discuss their cases in detail. And then if time permits, I'll present uh, one as well. Um, and we'll go from there. So I think if Shirish wants to share his screen, um, present his case, and then we can just take some questions afterwards. Uh, what is Shirish? Uh, are they not? Uh, Shirish, are you here? 
He was here. He was here. Um, can you go ahead with your That's case? Right no, no, no. Yes, yeah, Dipit here. Yeah. Dipit is not yet here. I think. Oh, then. Okay. Once is, they arrive, I'm, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll share mine first yes. while we're waiting. So, yes, uh, just just uh, save time. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes, uh, Anu. All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, <clears throat> I practice at Banner University Medical Group. Um, and my partner is Dr. Evan Letterman. This is actually his case. Um, pretty interesting. Oops. Let's see. So the case is a 48-year-old male police officer who was involved in a rollover motor vehicle accident who had bilateral shoulder dislocations, actually. Um, the case is interesting because this patient has a history of bilateral shoulder stabilization procedures in the 80s. So they were both open. He was grossly unstable and his axillary nerve was intact. Here's a scalp film from the CT scans. On the right, he had a Bristo back in the 80s. And on the left, he had an open uh, bank heart with a coracoid osteotomy. It's interesting how he's presented these similar uh, pictures, but I thought it would be appropriate because this is actually Sanjeev Bhatia, who was the first author. So another Indian uh, orthopedic surgeon at Northwestern. And he really came up with this linear versus surface, me surface area method of bone loss. And I think we all um, know the different methods, but really he came up with this fact that maybe 20% bone loss was actually equal to 14%, which kind of started this whole conversation of subcritical bone loss on when you know bony procedures were probably necessary. Something that uh, Evan Letterman came up with was just, you know, some mathematics. And this is actually in press, these, uh, um, an article coming out in JSCS International that I helped write with him. And basically the whole point of this was looking at the height of the defect and the maximal height of the glenoid and utilizing that ratio. And if that height from the ASL, which is the height of the defect to the maximal height, if it was 50%, that equals 12% bone loss. And you can see a minuscule increment in that ratio would equal to significantly more and more bone loss. And we thought that this paper was really important because in a lot of, a lot of times, folks may not have access to you know, advanced imaging. They may not have um, access to the software that the radiologists have to calculate the surface area method and so forth. So by utilizing this simple ratio of the height, um, the bone loss height to the glenoid height, you can kind of figure out what you needed to do, especially in countries where CT scan or MRI may not be readily available. So on this uh, particular case, we'll talk about the left shoulder. As I had mentioned, this guy had an open uh, bank heart with a coracoid osteotomy. When we look at the height of the bone loss, you can see it's probably less than 50%. I couldn't find the original images to do my own new measurements. These were from before. But we know that this is probably greater, I'm sorry, less than 50% when we looked at that ratio. And so what was done was um, we looked, we scoped the patient, found that he had essentially a small bony bank heart with a large hill sacs lesion. And so what was done was um, a standard uh, bony bank heart arthroscopic repair along with uh, a two anchor remplissage to act as a tether to keep the humeral head centered within the glenoid cavity with minimal bone loss. On the right side, um, a little bit more complicated, he had an open uh, bristo that never healed. And so you can see that the height of that on the left is definitely gonna be more than 50% of the maximal height of the glenoid. So we know we're dealing with, you know, at least 20% at least bone loss on this uh, patient in the setting of a prior bristo. So we know we can't use the um, coracoid because that was already taken. And so we need to find an alternative along with a, a large hill sacs. And so here you can see the CT scan preoperatively, which shows that non-union of the bristo procedure. Hmm. And so what was done here was a DTA, a distal tibial um, allograph, with three screws, and you can see the prior anchors um, from the previous surgery as well. Um, that's really pretty much it. This patient was seen at about one year out, um, about three or four years ago. And per uh, the office notes, you know, he had a near full range of motion. He still lacked about 
10 to 15 degrees on the right side and near full motion on the left. Obviously a limited external rotation on the right side, but other than that, the patient was stable and had no uh, recurrences at, at the three year mark. Any questions? And hey, this is Shree, thanks. You know, usually, we usually kind of have the background, uh, you know, made up and uh, it's nice seeing your background being the Maldives. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hey, going back to the first case, I had a couple of questions. So in terms of when you do a replissage and you're doing an anterior stabilization or an arthroscopic plus procedure, what are your, what are your kind of steps in terms of, do you do the replissage first, do the anterior stabilization first? Um, what are your uh, order in how you um, do this? A great question, Sri. Um, so if once I've scoped the patient, if I've decided I'm going to do a remplissage, I've adopted the technique since I'm actually a beach chair guy, except for instability. So if I know I'm going to do an arthroscopic instability case, that's lateral decubitus for me. I take care of a lot of football players and high school kids are just big. And I've found that I can really get great access um, inferiorly. For the remplissage portion, since I'm scoping in the lateral decubitus, for those of us that are beach here, sometimes getting into the subacromial space can be a challenge when you're not doing it that often. And so there's actually an all intra-articular uh, remplissage technique that I will use. And it's very similar to uh, utilizing these two suture anchors, but with the knotless fiber tack system and utilizing um, either fiber sticks and different straws to keep your suture straight. I will actually place my two anchors into the hill sacks defect don't tie them so I don't close or tighten up that space. And then I will start um, with my bank heart. I typically, as Romeo has um, discussed eloquently, is I will typically put one anchor a little bit more posterior or at the seven or five o'clock position, just depending on which shoulder it is. Really tighten up um, that posterior uh, labrum and form a little bit of a capsular orphy there. And then just march my way upward um, from you know seven, six, five, four, three, however many you wanna put. And then I will go back and tighten up my remplissage. I found that if you do the bank part and you tie those up, getting access to the uh, hill stacks can sometimes be challenging. So if you already have your sutures in place, all you've got to do is pass them. And with this knotless fiber tax system, it makes it very, very, very simple. Yeah, those so are great then, problems. Sorry, so, so, so do, you, do you always know then if you're doing a remplissage before you do the bank cart? So, I mean, the idea of doing a bank cart and then seeing intraoperatively, or are you using images preoperatively say, I'm doing a remplissage based on on track, off track? I think you have an idea. And if it's off track, I'm typically prepared to do one. But a lot of times, you know, you'll look at that bank cart and you'll see if it actually engages. You'll see the quality of the, uh, you know, the bank cart tissue and so forth. And um, I would say 70% of the time, I'm fairly accurate in terms of my preoperative assessment on whether I'm going to perform a hill sacs or not, a uh, remplissage or not. Anu? Anu? Anu, I believe you have a paper on the uh, revision lethargies with all the neurological changes that are at risk because of the change path of the nerve. Did you in practice uh, notice that? So when I wrote that paper with a JP in my fellowship, um, the whole point of that paper, you know, which was 10, 12 years ago, and I think we've all become a lot more mindful of traction injuries. And so once these complication papers come out, I think everybody's um, <clears throat> sense of awareness um, becomes a lot more uh, um, hypersensitive, if you will. And so in terms of when we place our retractor medially, right, um, after you make your horizontal splint on the subscapularis, I think we know, hey, if we're not in the joint, let's just relax that retractor. It's very similar to shoulder arthroplasty. When we're trying to get access to the posterior shoulder, we ask our assistant not to maintain tons of traction. So I think we don't necessarily see a lot of those um, complications, but I think a lot of them are also underreported too. Um, how many of us are actually getting EMGs and nerve conduction studies postoperatively? Um, you know, a lot of these neuropathies are sensory neuropathies. And so typically we know that just waiting, most of these will go away. In that paper, um, there wasn't a significant like motor deficit. Most of these were just traction neuropathies for, where they were more sensory. 
um, in origin, in etiology. And so they typically will go away once, um, you know, you give it enough time. So I'm probably seeing some, but we just wait and we really provide reassurance to the patient that, hey, these are sensory issues. They will come back. So actually, um, I was fascinated by the paper because uh, since I started doing the arthralataje, a couple of cases when I went back in to remove the screws, and in the open surgery, you don't realize it that much, but when we went in arthroscopically, we saw the axial nerve was skirting that inferior screw very closely, and you get a much better perspective, and then you are like, we're so close to disaster there, especially when you go in the second time. So it's very important that you use the right word, mindful, so that if you're aware, then you're going to do that dissection very carefully because one injury to the axial nerve, it's all gone. So that's actually a really great point. Um, we know that these nerves can sometimes migrate, especially when you're increasing that A to P distance with um, these bony procedures. And that, that's actually um, a very great point, especially if you're considering removing these screws arthroscopically because it's, it's sitting right on top of it. So it's a great point, Ron. On the same line, when you do the revision for the second case, uh, do you go do you go and dissect the nerve, protect it because there is a previous fixation failed with the screws, etc. Anu, um, so I think if you're performing a bone procedure yeah. other than a ladder J, you're really releasing the entire subscap, right? So there may not be a need to go and identify that nerve unless you can palpate it. I will tell you routinely, um, I was trained this way and I have residents and we have a fellow. Um, I identify the axillary nerve on pretty much every shoulder arthroplasty case because it's, it's fairly straightforward with the arm and forward flexion and you can identify it by just elevating the conjoint tendon. In these revision cases, there's so much scarring in that area. It just, I think you're asking for a little bit of trouble unless um, you're fairly confident that you can find that because the nerve does migrate a little bit. So I, I wouldn't have... I, I don't typically find it in a revision study if I'm taking off the entire subscapulars. Okay. Th thank you, Anu. Uh, if you can unshare the screen, I think Shirish is ready with this case. He's back. Great. And then you can take it through, Shirish. Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, go good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be part of IASES. In fact, I was just talking to Ram. I got confused with AM and PM. I, I thought it's at 7 p.m. So... <laughs> I was a bit late. So let me share the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So I'm going to present one case scenario. 22 year old gentleman uh, who plays badminton as an amateur player with history of right shoulder dislocation for six times. First episode was four months back. Uh, before he presented to me, a uh, close reduction was done by a local doctor under general anesthesia. The recent one, the sixth one was three weeks back. And after first one, probably all five, he could self-reduce himself. Now he comes with pain and instability. On clinical examination, he has got apprehension positive, Job's relocation positive. He has typical mid-range instability. Cuff strength is good and he does not have generalized laxity. These are MRI scan and CT scan representative images, which can show a significant glenoid bone loss, a bankard tear, and a moderate hill sacs. On CT calculation, reported as non-engaging hill sacs. Now, I have a patient who is young, 22, recurrent dislocator, Bankart lesion, 18 to 20% of glenoid bone loss, non-engaging hill sacs. And these are the options. So I would ask the panelists, uh, how many of you would go for lethargic, a bony procedure, or would still like to go for a Bankart repair with rompelisage? And if at all, if you go for a bony procedure, what would be your option? Would you go for lethargic, adenhybinate, open, arthroscopic, can you go back to the uh, bone loss calculation slide? It's about 18 to 20% with Sugaya best fit circle method. 
Can you go back yes. to the slide, uh, Sirish? Yeah. Yeah. So young, young athletes uh, with uh, subcritical or critical bone loss, always the dilemma for me, whether to go for soft tissue procedure with added remplissage or to go for a bony procedure. So the reason why I'm um, looking at this is, you know, a badminton player is not necessarily a contact athlete. But they definitely will require range of motion. And so if this was a contact like a football player, basketball player of some sort, I would have no hesitations on uh, performing a ladder J. But to be frank, you know, we don't typically see a lot of badminton players with recurrent shoulder instability. So I think of this as more of an overhead thrower's athlete, to be perfectly honest. And so with um, new literature showing that you don't really lose range of motion with a remplissage um, and nothing is really burned by performing an arthroscopic bank heart and remplissage. My initial gut is telling me to consider that to do an arthroscopic uh, bony bank heart repair because I can still see a little bony fragment there. And if I can create and buttress that, especially if it's fresh um, along with the remplissage and center the humeral head, and see how they do. Now I would probably uh, consent this patient to a possible ladder J because if I scope the patient and I'm like, wow, this is actually much more than I anticipated in terms of bone loss, I would you know, reposition the patient and perform a ladder J. That would be my answer. So I-, I How about want... the rest of the panel? Oh, yes. How about yes. the rest of the panel? Let's, let's ask the rest of the panel what they would do. If Hafiz oh, and Hafiz. if- uh, yeah. So Anup says he will try a diagnostic scope and would probably bias towards bankard with rhomplisage. Yeah, I mean, I think I think my only concern is that, so he's dislocated five times. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, I think when you, when you have like bony bankart with recurrent instability, like I'm not in my success. I mean, like how viable that piece is. I mean, I think when it's like one or two. And it's a fresh injury. And I think that, you know, sometimes that can heal, but I think with my concerns would be that, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's, it's different with like an overhead athlete rather than a contact player, but I think once you hit 20%, I mean, for me, that's probably going to be a primary bone block procedure. So I, I think in terms of taking which one you do, I mean, I think, you know, a ladder is reasonable. I mean, in a 22 year old, I think now with what we're learning about, distal tibial allograft and what you can get away with in terms of like a cartilage restoration procedure. Um, if that's available, I mean, it's expensive. Um, sometimes it's, there are the problems associated with, with getting it, but if it was me and it was my kid and I was 22 and I had that, I mean, I, I'd want to, I'd probably want to get matched for it, for a DTA for that. Would you, would you prefer an arthroscopic lethargic or would uh, go for an open cunt sort of procedure? Uh, arthroscopic, if the guy knew how to do it. So, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's the problem. I mean, I, I don't do them cause I, I wouldn't do enough to be confident in it. So I think it would just, it would just depend on the, the ability. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't even know that many people who do arthroscopic enough that I would feel comfortable to do it. I mean, there are people around, uh, just not where I am and, and I don't. So I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, I think it would just depend on how, how comfortable they, they would do it. What I would do in this case would be an open distal Open bony procedure. Okay. Any any different uh, opinion uh, from the panelists? I think I saw Deepit on there. Let's uh, uh, hear uh, Deepit. Uh, Deepit. Uh, Deepit. Hi. 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 How are you? Should I? What is, yeah. You know, can I can I give you my comments? Hello? Yes, deep in, although I know it. No, but yes, yeah, please. no, there is there is a little bit of there is a little bit of uh, knowledge that we've gained in the past latter days. So sometimes latter days, you know, if he's playing badminton with the same hand, mm -hmm. the latter days sometimes interfere with the this motion. Okay, I've seen this in some of the patients. So I'm I'm in a current dilemma if for uh, for uh, the badminton players if they are playing badminton with the same hand okay 
Yes, it's a dominant hand. Yes, it's a, if it's if it's the hand being used for badminton, you know, um, <laughs> uh, I may go in for iliac press bone graft um, for just for badminton players because some of my players, you know, they've had they've not gone back to doing this smash hits after latter days. So uh, currently, still I'm uh, you know studying that aspect of latter days um, for both for cricket um, fast bowlers. And for badminton smashers, so it's a. Uh, I'm not really sure if uh, why latter days in some of my patients have had that uh, that problem, but it's like 20% of the patients have not been able to bowl on the same speed, and uh, even some of the badminton players they say that they've not been able to uh, hit the smashes after latter days at the same speed. This is only 20%. But uh, it is concerning. So if he's using, I mean, I mean, uh, I may also go for iliac crest bone graft. Um, if it is not, uh, if, if if it is the dominant hand or, or the hand <clears throat> being used to play badminton. Right. Right. Okay. Repeat. Money. Uh, I'm hi, hi, currently hi, reeling. Hi. How are you? Reeling for a big shock uh, listening <laughs> to your statement. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. We were expecting completely something different. This is a sea change. Uh, <laughs> you're right, but it's not about the graft. um the is because the inferior capsule and the labrum are not addressed so right. if you are able to do a bankard capsule shift along with the latage right. and not put the graft high right. because if you put the graft high then you're going to restrict the external rotation right. which will impede his overhead movement correct so you have to be very uh, perfect in your positioning of the graft and definitely get that inferior capsule and bankard repair so um over the last 3 3 and a half years we've been doing a atholatage combined with a inferior capsule and a labrum shift right. and uh, i have about half a dozen uh, bowlers and badminton players and tennis players and seem to be back in play and doing well i think in the presence of bone loss offering a soft tissue repair is fine but it will just rest, uh, create a very high risk for a redislocation it doesn't happen immediately <clears throat> their peak time for redislocation is usually at 4 years to 5 years uh, we've done this to gymnasts as well and swimmers and uh, as i said if you can get the capsule and the labrum you are giving them the proprioception and the instability in 180 degrees is related to the inferior part of the joint the latage is very good at giving you a mid range instability typically for the rugby players but if you can match both together then they will have bigger bang for their buck i think i think right. our uh, our aim should be towards anatomical repair of both capsular labral tissue as well as bone defects uh, and restoration of movement yes anyway over to shirish uh, yeah. to know what so, uh, in the same line what ram just mentioned so if you look at the mri he has got a very good juicy labral tissue so i wanted to have best of both worlds where i could do a good anatomical repair with bone graft so i came up with the option of a scapular spine bone graft with a bankard repair so what i did was i because i am a lateral decubitus guy although i have done arthroscopic latharge procedure but i am more comfortable in lateral position so what i did i harvested a 2 by 1 by 1 cm uh, scapular spine graft in the mid third part of the spinous process prepared it very well and used a arthroscopic encerclage technique uh, to fix this bony defect and on top of that do a good robust bankard repair now you can see this is the right shoulder maybe i'll just quickly get through you can see a nice repairable bankard repair although we can see a flattening of anterior glenoidal margin uh, so what i did i just liberated it very well till 6 o'clock created a nice space for the bone graft to accommodate then this labral tissue it comes in your way while you are uh, placing the graft so what i did <coughs> i took a retraction suture over there to pull it looped it around and uh, so that in the process of my bone grafting i can my assistant can keep pulling the labral tissue away then harvested a graft and uh, 
many pushes. Using this Arthrex jig with uh, transglenoid uh, two tunnels, which are parallel at about a centimeter, pushed the shuttle wires, and then this scapular spinous graft was delivered inside the shoulder joint and fixed with a knot at the back. So this was precisely matched to the uh, almost three to five o'clock position at a subchondral level. And then I inserted three anchors like uh, just a standard bank card repair and made this graft uh, extra articular. You can see a stable fixation of the graft after putting two encircled loops and a nice juicy labrum was brought back with a good inferior capsular shift to give a robust bank card repair. This, this is a photograph of jig which goes parallel to the surface of glenoid posteriorly and you can safely drill two tunnels under orthoscopic control in the lateral position. Standard three portals what we use in the bank art repair. This is an immediate post-op. You can make out a graft is nicely sitting over there in the anteroinferior part of the glenoid. This is six month post-surgery wow. and this is the clinical picture. Sideways. He has got Okay. Near so normal so range of movement, good external rotation, still lagging by 10 to 15 degree of external karke, rotation. Karo, is on the hand. Side ka. And uh, you can Jitna see six month post op x ray, which shows a good incorporation of the graft and it is sitting well. It's such a cosmetic okay. incision. What are the advantages of this procedure? I think it's anatomical. You can use a local bone graft. Sometimes when I offer it in hibernate, iliac crest bone graft, acceptance is not so great. I can do it comfortable in that position. Most importantly, I don't need a subscap split, which is a big step in arthroscopic lethargy surgery and which takes at least half an hour in my hands. No metallic implants and we are safely away from neurovascular structures. You don't have to dissect nerves like you do in arthroscopic lethargy and I feel it's more cosmetic. Although there are certain downsides, uh, graph size, if you are not careful enough, uh, you may land up with a smaller graph. Sometimes anatomy of scapular spine is variable. So you have to have a preoperative CT scan to be sure that you have about two centimeter uh, long and reasonably one centimeter wide graph. Uh, if it is osteoporotic, loosening of sutures cut through and loosening of good suture fixation is an issue. Definitely, we don't have a sling effect, which we do have with a lethargic procedure. And of course, in the beginning, it's just a bit technically demanding. This has been described very well by Hachem and uh, uh, very proven biomechanically. And it gives a good fixation as good as screws. Uh, this is a paper by Morodor where he have given technical tips to how to do an arthroscopic bone block technique. But using scapular spine. Uh, this paper I could find out with, uh, which is published by Chunian Jian from China, where he has used scapular spine graft, but he has done fixation with suture anchors. And it's a very interesting paper, two years follow, 27 patient, no dislocation, excellent functional outcomes. And he also looked at the uh, resorption rate at one year follow, and they found out it was about 20%. So still, I think it is comparable with any other graft like uh, Coracoid or Eden Hibernate. This is another paper where they have compared the dimensions of Coracoid, iliac crest and scapular spine by doing CT measurements in 50 patients. And they have said it's comparable and uh, the best location for harvest of scapular spine graft is about 5 cm lateral to medial scapular border. So I think this is uh, what nowadays I do for a certain select number of patients. I've, I've done about a dozen of patients and I'm pretty, pretty happy with the results and going more confident. So I think we can have best of both worlds where I have a bone graft. At the same time, I can do a good bony, bank, a bony soft tissue repair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was great and super innovative. Um, <clears throat> I think I would have never even considered the scapular spine. I mean, I've read a little bit about it, but 
you've made it look so easy that I think a lot of us are probably going to try that at some point. So thank you for that. Um, I think we're uh, running a little bit behind. And so I think Rom wanted to proceed on to the next session. So I'm really yeah. sorry, but if we have some time towards the end, we can get to the next cases. Is that okay, Rom? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think because uh, uh, we have other commitment for the other faculties. Uh, can we move to the next session? Thank you, Anup. Thank you, um, Sherish and uh, Dipit. Uh, we'll invite Dr. Sundar Rajan to give his talk on acute rotator cuff repair. Sundar, you are there? Yeah, yes, Ram. Yeah, can you share your screen, please? Thank you. Can you see, Tom? Oh. Yes, yes, please. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, any, any, any rotator cuff surgery, including acute uh, rotator cuff, I think it's important that choosing the right patients. So to make sure that your diagnosis is perfect, because sometimes you may think it's an acute tear. Sometimes in the chronic patients, you can have an acute on chronic situations. So it is important that make sure that uh, and this patient has got a really acute tear and you are planning for the surgery and counseling for that particular patient is uh, uh, okay. And uh, we know that all the cup tests are not same. That includes acute cup tear also. So you have a, a too many different uh, uh, tear configuration. So we had to make sure that this complete approximation of this cuff to the entire footprint and the healing is better. So this is a 50 years old male patient presented with the pain and instability to elevate right shoulder for two months duration. He had a two wheeler accident for just fall on the on his right shoulder. And that was a picture. He was not able to uh, do an active elevation at all, even after two months of his conservative treatment. This is the MRI uh, report shows the uh, footprint tear. So when you see uh, this kind of tear, we have a dilemma whether to do a, uh, a repair or not. Anyway, in that, and also the question is an acute tear to do an ultrasound or MRI scan is a question. I think still MRI is very valuable to identify the quality quality of the cuff by seeing the fat infiltration and occupancy ratio. And we have a fair idea of the retraction. So I think still all the patients in acute cases also, we do an MRI scan to know the quality of the cuff. Should we need to operate all the complete cuff tears, especially in the previous case as we shown, we may not require, but sometimes even an acute tear, even if there's a complete tear, especially in a old age patients, very severe degenerative, uh, I mean, not a degenerative tear, I mean, there's acute and degenerative tear, less demand and non-dominant cases, severe medical comorbidities, still we can treat conservatively. Of course, the, all the acute injury patients with the pain and functional deficit, deficit that they require a repair. What you want to achieve in acute tear is that we want to have a good structural healing with the functional outcomes of with the uh, satisfied patient. Of course, the, what is important is to reduce the retard rate, especially if there is a massive cup tear. Even in acute massive cup tear, we know that the uh, chances of getting retard is very high. The surgical technique and optimum rehabilitation protocol is uh, key to get the successful outcome in acute repair. So here, the very important is that to get the mobility of the cup to the entire footprint without any tension, so that it limits the tension overload and reduces the risk of failure. So the cuff mobilization to the footprint is the key and also to understand by using the tissue grasper to pulling the graft on either anterior direction or the posterior direction, which direction that is moves. And you have to decide whether which side which you had start doing the anchoring and suturing and tying the knots are very uh, important so that you don't create any dog gear and you don't do any mismatch when you do a repair. So when you have a small tear like this, always we have concern whether to what kind of uh, uh, method to do use. Sometimes you just use it with a single anchor with uh, like a modified mass and allen stitches will do very well uh, with a good functional outcome. And most common acute tear, what we, what we see in our day-to-day -day practice, the crescent-shaped uh, tears. And uh, in these cases, we can do a single row or a double row, which is the uh, commonly practiced among, amongst us. So the single row, uh, what method to use? There are, uh, I think the most commonly used is the SUI. We, I tend to use as SUI 
and when to choose the things choose the single row is the always question in the back of the mind but when you have a i always choose single row when there is a small footprint where you don't you can <clears throat> just with the single anchor you can cover entire uh, uh, footprint then i use the single row where i just take 4 to 5 mm um, lateral to the margin of the articular surface uh, you can you can make a triple loaded um, anchors just make a single stitch um um uh, of the uh, cuff and once you complete the tear then you, you use the uh, micro fracture for your um, uh, cuff formation so this is well described procedure they do very well in in most of the situation with uh, uh, small footprint sometimes they even the footprint which is not covered you can use the micro fracture as we described anyway they said that uh, you can uh, it can give that equivalent result to the double drop so the question when you do a single row in acute cup tear we know that sometimes we may not cover the entire footprint and is it equally as good as a double row is the controversy the thing all of us know that double row repair yields a twice the footprint coverage in comparison to the single row especially when you have a large footprint tear and also the strength of the double row is better than the uh, single row however even though there is no difference in the functional outcome in these uh, both when you do, when you do a double row uh, when you do a when to when to do a double row is the, the question in my hand most of the time i try to do a double row because it is very very difficult to achieve you can see the footprint of this patient it has got a, around 2 cm it is impossible to achieve with your uh, single row even though uh, you can do uh, do the other methods of the single row repair so in my hand when, whenever i uh, try to do a cuff a cuff repair most of the i mean 80% of the situation i do the Uh, double row repair i always make a simple matter stitches without tension and make sure that you are not going into the musculocutaneous junction which is the one of the common cause of failure when you do a uh, repair of your cuff so make sure that you are taking the weights in the tendinous portion when you tie the knot also don't make it too tight so that the try don't triangulate the tissue and the impose and the impairs the vascular supply so making the double row repair uh, here Yes, in any especially when you make a lateral row again the question is how many threads and how many uh, how much distance to cover in a lateral row is also a question so in my opinion that there are commercially available lateral row with uh, too many options like a six uh, threads seven threads but we have to keep it in mind that when you put more threads more wide coverage resulting in the more stress on the <coughs> lateral anchor can result in failure so try try to keep it simple with a small coverage of the area with uh, three threads or two threads are uh, good enough for any lateral anchor to get a successful outcome of course you have a knot plus techniques uh, like a speed bridge technique where you don't need uh, don't need to do any uh, tying i think it's good enough uh, if you have a, a simple anterior supraspinatus stair without uh, any retraction this makes a very simple technique by using the three medial and the three uh, sorry two medial and the two lateral row anchors just making a two bites Uh, and uh, shifting swift, the uh, uh, fiber wire, fiber uh, tape on either side, making a simple stick. <clears throat> But however, the chance of failure is bit higher, especially if the bone quality is not good. So you have to make sure that when you do a knotless techniques, always make sure that the bone quality is good enough so that your anchor is not failure. Because even if the medial anchor fails, then whole construct is going to fail. So when you use a knotless techniques, we have to keep it in mind that. you are a bone quality is good but when you have a, like a, this kind of u shape tear even if it's an acute tear sometimes the apex will not come to the footprint so in these cases we know how to approximate these cases so it is impossible to bring this apex to the footprint so what we do that you do make a side to side stitches even though mechanically it may not be stronger cuff repair than the uh, the uh, normal cuff uh, where you are bringing to the footprint but still it is reasonable to do that uh, side to side approximation the so once you do the side to side approximation then you make an anchor on the uh, footprint on the two sides and uh, on the end uh, on the end you make it a, a, a stable construct by uh, uh, putting in the lateral row too so that is the uh, la- lateral row after do a side to side approximation two medial anchors and two lateral anchors so that will give you the uh, whole construct which is very stable even though biomechanically slightly weaker but it gives the good approximation with a good healing of the entire uh, shoe, uh, u-shaped tear like this and uh, with a good coverage of the footprint 
So this is a 45 years old male patient. Sometimes even it's called as an acute, sometimes patient comes very late, especially here. You can see the proximal migration of the humeral head. You see the uh, uh, tear of both supra, I mean, supra, infra, and subscap, which is retracted almost at the glenoid level. You can see here. So you, you cannot call it as a chronic. Sometimes we extend to he, see the patients, and uh, the, even though it's an acute traumatic tear, they come a bit late. So we call it, uh, we can call it a neglected, but they come up to two months or three months, or this patient is a five months old. So what we'll do for this kind of cases, but reasonably the quality of the muscles are very good. So here the subscap mobilization is very, very important. So otherwise it's not impossible to bring it, especially when you see a patients like this. So here, um, uh, uh, Separating the subscap between the coracoid and also glenoid and subscap is very important. So we do the anterior clearance for, uh, very well between the uh, coracoid between the coracoid and the subscap. Then once you've done that uh, uh, anteriorly, then you come to the posteriorly. Then separate the adhesions in the between the glenoid and the subscap. That will get you the subscap mobilization. So always it is a time-taking procedure but it's a painstaking procedure. But once you get the subscap, then it is uh, repairing the supra and infra is very, very easy. So here we are doing the entire subscap mobilization and getting attached to the footprint. The once you do the subscap approximation, the retraction of the glenoid of the supra and infra place automatic, comes to, automatically to the your footprint and doing the repair is easier after that. Then here you do the double row of these supra and infra then finally you do the entire construct uh, with this table. To conclude, proper mobilization and approximation even in acute cases is very, very important and that is the key to success. And single or double door repair, the principles are important. In massive tears, subscap mobilization is the key for the successful cuff repair of supra and infra. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. Uh, Thank you, Ram. Morning, comments and questions? So, I mean, I think you covered a great amount of content. And I think, you know, the, the only thing I would say is maybe just in terms of construct failures in acute tears, right? At the cuff side, do you think the type of suture, the quality of tissue, how do you address those issues? Because what we see is really not the failure as often in the bone but as much more in the soft tissue side of things. So maybe, maybe so there's sort of the, the thoughts and discussion around that maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree. And uh, many times we may not have the control of the tissue quality. Uh, when you have an acute tear in younger patients, it's always easier. Like uh, many cases which I have shown, these all acute tears in uh, younger patients, like uh, about 45, 50, Sometimes very, very rare to see uh, younger patients coming with just fall on the shoulder and getting a cup tear. Uh, many times you get the same acute tear in the older patients where the chance of failures are a bit higher than the younger patients. So usually the age determine, determines the failure uh, a bit more than the younger patient, especially in the older age. And of course, as you said, that cup quality um, uh, and uh, taking the bites where you take your bites of your cuff is very, very important. As already said that you have a more failures when you take a bites close to the muscular tendinous junction. So you have to make the, and the distance is not same for each patient. You know, some patients will have a one centimeter of the tendon, some people have one and a half centimeter of the tendon. So individually, you have to assess the patient, make sure that you're taking a bite in a good tendinous portion so that it uh, doesn't fail over there. When you're coming to the sutures, uh, usually we are using the fiber wire most of the time. Sometimes when I feel that the quality of the tissues are not good, it's failure. Uh, sometimes you can also have a failure of the anchors when the quality of the bone is good. Then I use sometimes uh, rip, ripstop sutures to reduce the stress on the both the sutures and as well as the anchor so that you reduce the tension on your repair. So at the end, I think we have to make sure that you're taking the bites on the cuff portions, uh, tendon portions, and you don't put too much tension on the cuff and uh, make sure that you are not also uh, putting less stress on your anchors by, may, your, by doing the proper planning of your threads, how many anchors which are going to use. Good. Can, can, I ask, can I ask quickly just what the current 
thoughts are in India on augmentation of, of cuff repair? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm really quite interested because I mean, here in North America, I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's standard, but it's, 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 it's taking off for, uh, you know, like, like, like rockets. So what's the current thought process in India on like graft augmentation type of like a dermal allograft? Like how does that all come into the conversation? Yeah. So in, of course it's not relevant to this topic because it's an acute tear, but still in chronic situations, um, uh, later in the latter part of my these last two three years, I had done a couple of uh, uh, lawyer trapezius transfer uh, for my chronic uh, <coughs> cases. Of course, uh, like uh, augmentation with uh, maybe uh, augmentation we don't do, but we do a few cases like superior capsular reconstruction with uh, uh, facial eta. Still, we are all uh, uh, not confident of doing that because we don't know the, what is the uh, long term results. Still, we are not sure. But we are worried whenever there is an, uh, when we are not able to repair the infraspinatus, that is the major issue for most of us. If you could, uh, uh, in these cases, usually we augment or do a tendon transfers. But when you have a problem of uh, proximal migration where you could repair the infraspinatus, you can have a subscap, very, very good subscap. But the problem is only the uh, elevation, but external rotation is good. In that cases, we do few cases of superior capsular reconstruction. Uh, but otherwise, uh, most of the cases where I have a post-row post inferior cuff problems in chronic cases, I do few tendon transfers. I've done few tendon transfers. It's good. But uh, Ram, your opinion? I think uh, I, I agree with uh, mostly uh, what you said. Uh, in my practice, I use the long header biceps, which is available right in there in massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, you can either reroute it or you can uh, attach it to the superior part of the greater tuberosity just to augment uh, local craft, uh, least expensive, no much additional anchor involved. If the, as far as the uh, uh, the biceps is attached to the glenoid, you could probably do that. That is the easiest augmentation in my practice. And other, all the other biological or synthetic augmentation or expensive or time consuming. Well, and it's interesting in the United States, I do think, and Hafiz brings it up, that, that there's been a real push for the biologic augmentation. So, you know, we talk, you guys are talking about biomechanical augmentation with biceps and with lower trapezius in the United States. And I think it's very probably maybe biased by our industry, but these are dowels, these are dermal allografts, things that actually don't add a lot of biomechanical strength but supposedly might add biologic. So it's a it's an interesting paradigm shift in the United States toward these sort of things without a lot of scientific evidence. So, and, and, and it's happening in an acute tear. I mean, I think the other thing that you see in the United States is sort of also is the idea of tension and perhaps using graphs to help with this tensioning aspect. Instead of using some of the traditional methods where putting your anchors in the Raja, you talked about kind of planning your tear to try to detension it, people are using augmentation also as sort of a bridge to tensioning. So it's a very interesting shift. And I think, you know, you guys are still using fire, fiber wire. And I think a lot of people and the shift has gone to not list techniques in the United States. You're using whether these, the, the, and there's all these new types of tape and, and sutures that are occurring, sort of the idea of not being pulled through or providing some tensioning in this, in this cuffs that seems to be a little bit disparate among our communities. Okay. Good. Yeah, like to go. yeah, the, okay. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, Ram said to move forward, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm gonna present one of the rotator cuff cases uh, as we had talked about. Um, this is gonna be an interesting case, I hope for you guys. Uh, so it's a 62 year old male. Uh, left shoulder pain. Uh, I'm just trying to move the screen around so I can show it. Uh, so here's the MRI images. So axial cut. You can you can see full thickness uh, uh, subscapularis. Uh, there's a full thickness infra as well. Here you can see the full thickness supra, high riding head. On the axial cuts, you can see relatively preserved cartilage in the surfaces. Uh, and then on the sagittal cut, you can see subscap full full thickness tear, but looks repairable. Uh, supra is not repairable and infra is retracted, you know, repairable. So case review, 62-year-old male, massive rotator cuff tear, 
MRI, full thickness superhood, greater than 5 centimeters retraction, full thickness subscap, full thickness infra, preserved cartilage. And, you know, kind of the key to point out is full uh, kind of preserved motion. You know, one of the copers, uh, 164 elevation. So the question then becomes, you know, in, in a relatively relatively young kind of person with preserved cartilage and preserved motion, what are the kind of options that we're thinking about? Um, anybody wants to chime in or should I just keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. From there, you want to take on? So what, is, what is the duration? Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't get that uh, duration of the symptoms. Oh, he failed 12 weeks of, uh, he did 12 weeks of physical therapy. He, he had an injection from an outside orthopedist or uh, prior to coming to see me. I put him through 12 weeks of physical therapy, still no improvement, pain at night. Um, he, he likes to play tennis you know, on the weekends. He's unable to kind of do his sporting activities. It's more for his you know, recreational sporting activities. So the, the uh, just, uh, sorry, I didn't get the duration of that uh, from injury to for your presentation to the to you. So he had seen an outside orthopedist. It was when he saw the outside orthopedist, they gave him an injection. So that was three months. And yeah. then by the time he saw me, I gave him another you know twelve weeks. He hadn't done any physical therapy. He didn't actually go. So I gave him you know kind of twelve weeks of physical therapy. But then you know so total was six months. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Okay. So once the patient has had three months of physiotherapy and rehab, what's the point of advising another three months of rehab? In the rehab, are we expecting the, that, that these muscles, I mean, if the guy's got a preserved motion and we know it's a full thickness tear which has retracted five centimeters, and do we think that with rehab, we are going to do if the patient is maintaining the motion today, or what's the guarantee that the patient is not going to lose the motion in the next three months and he is going to decompensate and then we are and 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 the and the muscles undergo fatty infiltration at that point of time and then we are stuck I think, with with I think that's a fair I think that's a fair options. point. No, I think that's a fair point. My, my kind of goal with him was, you know, do we really need to do anything, right? If you have this good motion. And you're still able to to be you know functional. Do we need to do something now? That that was my my methodology behind that. Um, but he's one mm -hmm. of those guys. You know, on, up here in Boston, you know, everyone's highly active. Everyone thinks they're you know still still forty playing tennis and everything. So he was highly energetic. You know, wanted to focus on playing tennis. So I kind of made him work for it, if you will. Um, but anyway, so he came back. You know, kind of six months. You know, three months three months from when I saw him. Um, still in pain, still dysfunction with tennis. So we talked about it. Plan was for arth arthroscopic subscap infra repair and then a lower trapezius tendon transfer with, with Achilles allograft. Um, so kind of going through it, uh, this was the uh, lower trap harvest that we had. He actually had a good muscle belly. Um, and, you know, the kind of what, what Bassam always talks about and what I, I was taught, kind of tubularization at the end really gives you better control and better incorporation for, for the tendon transfer. And then the other kind of thing you want to look for in the arthroscopy. So that's the tenant lower trap, you know, Achilles part of it laid down in the shoulder. But then this is the view you want to see where you can see the infra properly tension repair to your left. And then the tendon transfer coming over the top uh, to your right. Uh, and then this is the video post out. So you can see as you move external internal with the arm. I think the fellow was doing the arm, so <laughs> we'll wait a little bit to, to see it actually move to move the uh, Army Navy up a little bit. You can see it. Uh, and then once they kind of move in for, you know, internal, externally, you can see the, the lower trapezius as the Achilles was incorporated, you know, pulver, te pulver weave taft. Uh, you can see it move pretty well. Um, and then so, you know, external rotation sling for five to six weeks, progressing very well. Uh, came to me at three, you know, three months after we're, after doing PT, pain-free, full range of motion. That's him at three months, uh, and then currently now he's six months post-op, continuing, you know, make progress every day and strengthening. But he's very happy. He's back to playing tennis, he, you know, pickleball, these types of things in the Northeast they love, you know, pain-free, full range of motion, you know, with with good kind of functional strength in his sports, you know, quite happy. So, so, sir, were you focusing yeah. on the external rotation loss of strength? I mean, is that the main thing that this gentleman the main needed? Thing was pain. The main thing was pain. So he had, he had pain it's at night. We don't do a, 
Okay, but we don't typically select that particular option for it's really external rotation, right? That's tends to be yeah, what we do it for. Do you yeah, think yeah, his yeah, pain yeah. was due to loss of strength there? I do, yeah. I mean, he 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 was complaining on you know he didn't have a complete kind of uh, um, you know loss of external in in abduction, but he did have loss of strength and external rotation at the side. Uh, and pain with sporting activities in the serve uh, backhand forehand type of thing. So he, he fit the mold and, you know, he was kind of aggressive with his, his pain levels and dysfunction. Um, but, you know, it, it very, very well. And, you know, I've had a bunch of these now, uh, I think I've done 15 or 16 in the past kind of year or so. So it's, it, it's been a good, a good solution to these massive cuff tears with preserved cartilage and preserved motion. Uh, was the suppressed meniscus repairable, and did you think of uh, repair and augmentation as an option? Uh, I, I would have loved to repair the subscap. Yeah. I would have loved to repair the subscap, but the sub uh, super spinatus was not repairable. Now, yeah. subscap I repaired, and infra I repaired, and you know to really put it without the subscap. If the subscap's not repairable, I would not have done this because you really need that force couple front and back uh, to help with with you know kind of the function and pain relief. Thankfully, he had both, and then was able to get a good tendon transfer over the top. Uh, Sir, my yeah, question is: yes, yeah. Could could you repair the infraspinatus uh, completely, or could you do? A, did you do a partial repair of infraspinatus? No, I was able to get good sutures into the infra. The problem, you know, the reason that I didn't just leave them with subscap infra, which some people, you know, might have considered as as a viable option. You know, you have that force couple front back, but I was worried about the as we talked about the fatty infiltrate in his infra, and he had extra rotation loss, so. I, I kind of hedge my bet. If I can fix the info, that's excellent. That's like icing on the cake, you know, kind of the cherry on top. But if that ends up failing, I still have my tenon transfer to give some extra rotation. Yeah, that, that is the argument that people tend to ask when you do a lower trapezius transfer with infraspinatus repair. Um, so when you have a very, I, I mean, when you are able to repair completely your infraspinatus, sometimes they, they question the lower trapezius transfer. But uh, most of the time, when you have a long duration of six months like this, we are not, we, I, I'm sure that 100% we are not able to bring it to the uh, entire footprint. So naturally, I think uh, that, that, that I think still it's uh, logical to do a lawyer trapezius transfer in this case. Well, and especially in a guy like this, you know, yes. it, it, these people in the Northeast, and, and I'm sure everyone else can, can attest to this, you know, the, the expectations are quite high. So if it ends up being, you know, what, oh, you could have done both at the same time, you know, that kind of augments it and kind of gives you a backup at the same time. Yeah, our indications are almost. So, sir, yeah, you 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 chose only an external rotation sling uh, or a brace uh, for your uh, post-op uh, rehab or immobilization for the lower trapezius tendon to work. Uh, Basim usually advises some kind of abduction uh, for the for keeping yeah. it taut because if you are primarily yeah. choosing it for a supraspinatus, you have to have some kind of abduction built up into your ER brace. Um, yeah, so what's, what's there, there's a little bit of it? abduction in the brace that we give out. There's a uh, maybe 10 degrees of abduction. I know Boston goes way out, um, but so you know what yeah, I've seen. I, I because... tried that. I tried that early on. The patients just don't listen. So I'd rather at least if they give me some external, uh, I'll, I'll take yeah, that so over this... not listening to, at all. And I have had this trouble. I, mean, I, I did in a couple of my cases of lower trapezius transfer. I had the brace in a, like an aeroplane splint. Uh, they, uh, never, like they never keep it 60, on. 60 degrees abduction and ER and and it's, it's a job for the patient to maintain that brace for six to eight weeks um, but yeah but this is very very good that you could do it with only an ER brace fantastic yeah you kind of so you kind of have to exaggerate so it's not just gunslinger position I kind of have them 20 degrees out and patients are able to more tolerate this versus having all the mm -hmm. way, you know, a deduction with it. So yep. if, if I had to pick, I always pick the external rotation. And, you know, the first five to 10 that I did, I made them go full abduction, external rotation, you know, 60 degrees abduction with external, nobody listened. So the past, you know, I've done 15 the past year, the past 15 that I've done this year, I've all just had them, you know, kind of 10 degrees abduction with that, with that arc reg brace. And they do uh, external rotation kind of uh, in the gunslinger, just a little bit past gunslinger. Can you, so what is your takeoff point for, can a, you for a type your, of transfer? Can you unshare your screen, please? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. And then. So what is your takeoff point uh, for tendon transfer? 
Okay, let's so obviously let's it's a the massive it's a massive tear, and you know I, nobody else wants to do it in my area. So you know it's either they send it to Boston or they send it to me, unfortunately. Um, but so if, if they don't have a subscap that's repairable, even if they have a massive cut there, even if they have pre, you know preserved cartilage, in my opinion, they're not a good candidate because they don't you can't recreate that force couple. So they 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 need to have a, a repairable subscap in the front. Uh, but typically it, it's age range between you know, kind of 52 to 65, the oldest person I did was 64, um, preserved cartilage, and the motion has to be greater than 90 to 100 degrees. You know, Boston's paper showed it had to be greater than 90 degrees, otherwise it was a 30% failure rate when it's less than 90 forward elevation. Okay. Oh. Okay, uh, Wani, can I go ahead with my case? Absolutely. Okay, uh, so due to the time constraint, we'll be uh, quick. We'll show this case and uh, discuss briefly. So he's a 57-year-old businessman, a triathlon runner, uh, had a road traffic accident, he was a cyclist hit by a car, right shoulder injury. He was diagnosed to have a traumatic rotator cuff tear of supraspinatus, subscapularis, and a dislocated long handle biceps. So he had arthroscopic rotator cuff repair elsewhere. The operating note says it's a SCOI technique. Uh, surgeon couldn't repair the subscapularis by scopy, so he did the open subscapularis repair and bicep stenodesis and put uh, the arm in sling for six weeks. So this was the uh, six weeks post-op x-ray. Uh, any uh, comments, uh, Saro? Happy with that? Uh, so the head looks a little elevated to me. Um, looks like he had the subscap repaired and super repaired. Um, you know, some of those anchors are a bit medial, you know, for the super, it looks like. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, based on that description, I'd love to get a kind of, you know, it's a little soon to get another MRI, but at least an ultrasound to determine the integrity of the repair. That's, that's a good point. Wani, any comments? No, just a little concerns for arthritis too, you know. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is the patient that uh, three months, uh, complaints of pain and limited range of movement. And the treating surgeon uh, advised to continue physiotherapy. As you could see, the anchors are more medial location. And that is at the six months the presentation to me with no uh, progress, uh, continuing pain and dysfunction. Uh, flexion is 70, abduction 70, external rotation 20, internal rotation up to hip only. His uh, inflammatory markers are normal. He has got a well healed uh, surgical uh, scar. So that's the clinical presentation at six months post uh, this cough repair with the anchor uh, loosening. And that's the uh, amount of uh, flexion elevation he has. And that is a surgical approach to scar. So, uh, how to take it from here? Wani. Well, I mean, I think you're really concerned with motion. Obviously, he's high riding already. He's had an attempt at attempted cuff. Not only are you worried about soft tissue, but you're also worried about bone here, real estate. So, I mean, I think that you cannot minimize those medial anchors and those metal. And on this MRI, it's pretty obvious that he has a pretty large lesion. He's already into the articular surface. Yeah. And uh, these are the uh, subsequent uh, MRI images at six months uh, post. And um, so what, what will be your game plan? Or what, or what is the reason for a failure of this uh, cough repair? Set out. Uh, I mean, based on the images, probably suture pull through um, or, or, or too far medialization of the anchors, I think. Um, but I, I agree. I, I think now you're worried about bone loss. He has arthritis now. It's really high riding. How old is this guy again? He doesn't have much arthritis in the uh, existing glenohumeral joint, but agree that he has got a uh, bone, bony defect. How old is this patient, by the way? Sorry. Uh, sorry, I got the age. 57. 57. I don't know. It's it's very tough, especially with the minimal function. Um, yeah. I, I know. I, 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 it pains me to say this, but I think this might be a reverse. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
It's a big major decision. Uh, the other thing to know is that there is an anchor resorption. When somebody is not progressing, you have to always uh, think about infection as a background cause as well. Sundar, what is your uh, thought process? My question also is like that because uh, you, you said that ESR is normal, CRP is normal, but uh, here it looks like more of osteolysis. How was the quality of the bone drum when you, I mean, because you are not the primary surgeon, so it's yes. very difficult to say. Yeah. So a lot of osteolysis happened around the anchor because loosening happened. Um, or could be a subclinical uh, infection. I think we should keep it in mind. Uh, so I, I think uh, I, my feel still there could be a, some infection, even though the blood parameters are normal. Yeah, that is something. Hey, that Ram, can you go back to the coronals? Where's where? What are we looking at cuff wise? I don't see. I don't. There you go. A cuff is a degenerate. And uh, there's a problem in doing a couple of four metallic anchors there and do an MRI, even though whatever mm -hmm. compression you do, you still have uh, less uh, quality imaging. But ultrasound is a, another option to check the integrity. Uh, but clinically, but I, I think the one thing of note here, where we, we see these massive cuff tears, is that you know he still has cuff. I mean, there's retraction, but there's still some integrity. And when you looked at your atrophy, it wasn't significant, although we didn't have a T1. I mean, it's just of note that at least in terms of parameters, we look at the good, bad, and the ugly. To me, the bone loss and this massive sort of osteolysis around it is the most concerning. But there seems to be cuff that if you decided to bite and say that's even repairable, there is some tissue there. Yeah, exactly. I think there is some cuff there, but the failure is due to uh, maybe the perhaps the angle of insertion of the anchor as well as the most medial location. Uh, possibility. So how do we uh, take it now, Wani? So, I mean, you could you, you could consider, I, I think I'm more in Sarov. I mean, I, unfortunately, we tend to go to the reverses here much quicker. But I think, say you didn't and you wanted to sort of address this, you could consider a two-stage. You could bone graft and then come back and fix the cuff. You could also kind of lateralize what's cuffs left and consider augmentation. You know, I think you could also do an arthroscopic debridement, bone graft, and biopsy to rule out infection. Yeah. So those might be the options in your mind sort of thinking about this. I think I think I totally agree with that because the first step should be to uh, check it, remove all of these loose anchors and do a biopsy to check infection. Because if you want to take out something like reverse shoulder, you don't want uh, uh, infection. Uh, predisposing and uh, damaging your outcome and results. So that is my plan to the patient. Uh, shoulder. Any any comments before? Uh, I'll just proceed. So that is my plan. Uh, shoulder arthroscopy, removal of anchors and debridement, synovial biopsy. Explain to the patient that he might need repeated surgeries. Uh, that is uh, me doing the uh, arthroscopy. I do the arthroscopy in the lateral position. You can see the uh, synovitis and uh, just the debridement of that. And this is the posterior uh, compartment, synovitis, debridement. You could see some uh, cartilage erosion already happening. And this is the anterior capsular uh, additions being released. Synovitis again, we take multiple biopsy. And this is the rotator interval uh, being uh, released. You could see the subscap repair uh, beneath, which is intact. So that is at the end of your uh, debridement. As you could see, posterior most, you have a, a cart cartilage lesion as well as near the rotator cuff insertion point, you have a cartilage erosion. Only around 50-60% uh, of the uh, humeral head is uh, remaining. So that is your subacromial bursitis, uh, intense inflammations. I did a, a bursectomy. And as you could see, as rightly pointed out by Wani, there is some layer of cuff there. So I want to uh, uh, look at and locate the uh, anchors. So I need to uh, make uh, uh, incision or, or of the thin rotator cuff and go in and write on the uh, defect, which is quite medium of the rotator cuff footprint. So once I'm there, uh, I try to uh, probe in. And as you see, you cannot see the anchors end on because they were not put in the uh, vertical manner, but in a horizontal fashion. So just removing the suture, whenever we remove this uh, old suture or anchor, you need to uh, keep the uh, suture intact so that it will have a hold on the anchor to remove it. But the suture is coming free. 
And then next, I'm just uh, curating that area to find out, but I couldn't figure it out where the end of the uh, anchor is. So I just use uh, intraoperative CRM imaging to locate it before I go more curatage of the head. So that the first anchor was removed along with that one uh, stitch. So this is a metallic uh, anchor. And again, uh, curatage uh, preparation to uh, clear. Again, one more suture coming out. And uh, the second anchor, uh, as you could just uh, see the metallic tip, which is uh, quite horizontal. So this may be the reason why that whacking of uh, anchor uh, has resulted in loosening. So that I'm just hooking the suture, not cutting the suture because the suture knot may be still held, which will help you to remove the anchor like this. So both anchors with all the sutures were removed. And um, interestingly, that area is not uh, like looking infected. It's quite uh, clean. I did the curatage. So this is how it looked like now. You have a, a rotator cuff longitudinal uh, tear, degenerate cuff with a uh, metal with the bone defect there. And what is your take now, Wani? Well, I think there's just so much massive cartilage loss to me and the functional pre-op for this patient. I probably personally would say that the that without fixing that, the pain levels will still be quite high. You can fix this cuff. You can do a side-to-side -side repair, repair it to what's laterally left. But I still think that degenerative cartilage loss is concerning to me. Continue to do. Sundar, agree? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, but uh, how was the rehabilitation protocol for this patient before, uh, Ram? Was it done? Uh, uh, six, uh, it was done. Uh, uh, repair was done. And then the surgeon put in sling for six weeks. But he is a very active person. He's a triathlon runner. So there is no, uh, he's a very well initiated patient, motivated patient. Uh, anyway, uh, I was there uh, and then I thought it's clean. Uh, we need to have some uh, plan B for uh, reconstructing the shoulder. But I thought because I was there and I was also waiting for culture and test results, I just did a side-to-side -side closure of the cuff as well as I just want to tension the remaining cuff so that he can keep going in the meantime. So I just put a couple of uh, tapes, suture tapes in the apex, and then two more uh, sutures anterior posterior medially for the good portion of the rotator cuff. Then also use a couple of uh, PDS uh, sutures uh, to uh, absorbable suture to close the anterior posterior uh, defect. And this is the repair of the anterior posterior uh, cuff. And uh, taken a point which is very well below uh, wherever the good bone quality is, and then anchored it using the four, two tapes and two sutures. So this is the, at the end of the uh, revision uh, repair. Now I do understand there is the, still the bony defect there, which is still uh, remaining. So that's the uh, anchor, and that's the uh, final outcome at the time of otoscopy. Luckily, is uh, all uh, swabs came uh, negative for any infection. All cultures were also negative. So it's merely a question of uh, uh, surgically uh, induced anchor-related problem. Uh, so that's the uh, rotation afterwards. So that's uh, uh, my uh, all my rotator cuff repair. I do the same uh, mobilization from day two postoperative with assisted arm elevation up to 90 degrees, pendulum movements. Uh, shrug, brace roll, etc. And from four weeks, I would start full range of movement. I decided to do the same thing uh, here. Uh, that is him at uh, uh, six weeks, having a good range of uh, uh, external rotation, which is uh, pain-free. Uh, and that is the assisted elevation at uh, six weeks. And that's uh, him at uh, six months. So still there is a small elevation of the uh, shoulder, but is able to... Uh, sorry. Uh, have a good internal and external rotation uh, with reasonably good power on the repaired supraspinatus. Doesn't have much pain in the shoulder, but we need to watch the space. Comments? On Very good this? result. Very good result. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Ram, I think... Uh... 
yeah i uh, well, i really it was very rare to see that only the implant induced osteolysis with the techniques really very difficult to prove i don't know but uh, maybe the repair and post op rehab uh, did the wonder to get back him to have a reasonable uh, very good result yeah i think uh, so, uh, i just put a let me just i think i just put a slide some learning point but i don't yeah i think i just uh, make some points in the rotator cuff session i think proper planning and execution of rotator cuff repair is important and also mind the gt uh, which is a small uh, real estate and also angle of medial anchor insertion which is important and also very important to recognize the problem early when the patient is having pain and difficulty in moving i think you have to think twice before uh, progressing to blind continuation of physiotherapy and uh, always challenging uh, to salvage these problems okay. thank you the only thing is my concern is like uh, the pain is because of the osteolysis do you think or because of the anchors inside so what is the reason for the pain and not able to move the shoulder i think the still recently had a cuff intact cuff yeah i think the anchors uh, were in a, a different uh, location whacking and they got loose and they got a lot of osteolysis Uh, induced the cartilage uh, reaction etc number 1 uh, and number 2 that uh, cuff is not attached to the footprint because part of the footprint is gone in the bony defect and the lateral most the cuff is degenerating so partly the cuff is also uh, dysfunctioning so two reasons for the pain uh, thank you Thank you, uh, Vani. Shall we move to the next session, or how do you? Yes, because we have one more waiting. One more session. Uh, over to Ashish. Thank you, Ashish. Yes. Hi. Share your screen and start. Yes. Um. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you, Ram, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Sarab. Excellent session so far. so we'll start in the same order as was on the slides um uh, on the program card and we'll have a quick 5 minute presentation so so because we are running short of time instead of doing an interactive to and fro i'll just run through the presentation and save a lot of time so uh, apart from the challenging cases i think this was one of my nightmare cases where this was 73 year old lady who uh, had a gt fracture 3 years back and had had four surgeries in an attempt the first one was some kind of wires the second one was uh, a screw fixation third one was an implant removal and then finally given up uh, because the gt i think gives me far more grief than a proximal humerus fracture and just by the fact that the greater tuberosity has just dissolved it's come gone under con complete osteolysis there's a lot of learning lessons in this case she was operated in gujarat um, a uh, fair distance from pune where i practice and she came to me 3 years after the index uh, injury when she came in i realized that there was no anterior deltoid there's no lateral deltoid there is some semblance of posterior deltoid this lady was miserable uh, she couldn't sleep at night for almost 3 years now and she was disabled needed home help uh, to dress herself and get through the daily activities and she was really at the end of a tether my only job when i saw her the first time she came uh, highly recommended from two three fellows and i spent most of my considering time trying to dissuade her from coming in for surgery and saying that in the absence of a greater tuberous for three years and the fact that there is no anterior and lateral deltoid i don't think but i took some time and explained the lady actually got impressed and she said uh, i'm happy to do this surgery under you and i said i don't think it is worthy of doing a reverse shoulder so one of those first patients that i said it may not yield any result so i sent them back in the counseling room and told them to debate on this because it is indeed a high risk surgery and she came back with tears in her eyes saying that this is her last chance and she would really like me to do it so after reading all the riot act we got to the act my biggest challenge was the absence of soft tissue she was really fragile there was absolutely no anterior support no subscap no anterior deltoid i was worried about how do we tension this and 
would she dislocate anteriorly postoperatively and uh, the only hope for her and the you know little bit of light in this tunnel was uh, Bassam El Hassan's uh, publication on the fact that he's done several reverse shoulders and I've had a discussion one one on Bassam he's very gung ho on these and I'm very skeptic uh, in the absence of soft tissues but what i decided was yes we will offer a surgery because she is miserable and pain my biggest query was about how to offer her any form of anterior uh, stability so although the glenoid looked well the although there was steep proximal migration the reverse technique was least of my problems i decided we'll use a pec major transfer in order to give her anterior stability the reverse of course was a breeze uh, i wouldn't go into detail on that so the plan was to create a pec major graft which would transfer on its vascular pedicle and will fix it into the humerus i will try and uh, use that as a motor arm but we, even if it doesn't work like a motor arm even if it gives us a tino dc's kind of stability for that shoulder and achieve a, i didn't want my prosthesis to sit under the skin and if it gives me any form of strength gain then that's much uh that's a big advantage so we decided to shift the sternocostal part uh, sorry the sternoclavicular part across and you know uh, luckily she had a good pec major we done an ultrasound scan pre operatively and we ended up inserting it very close to the deltoid tuberosity and we achieved a good anterior cover for her so going the literature here there are several forms of pec major uh, flaps we certainly don't need the entire pec major flap it's a very substantial uh, so work cause for anterior transfers and so we chose the clavicular parts which would uh, shift over and give an anterior cover there was a blooper here what happened was uh, there were drains underneath the pec major and as is uh, our practice our fellow went in at 48 hours and removed all the drains and the plastic surgeon was absolutely uh, you know ravage that you can't remove a pec major drain in 48 hours because there's a huge hematoma there and she's going to lose and so there was a mismatch and this is what happens when your multi system I was upset uh, she did well initially but then started to lose for a long time for about 2 to 3 months and we cultured and there was no growth but eventually she settled down and healed up so we were extremely lucky that that hematoma did not get infected in the real sense but uh, there were some aha moments there really in now 27. coming in here uh, initially she was absolutely flail what you're looking at is purely elbow movements and there was a big struggle to get any form of movement i got this about a month back uh, she was 5 months post operatively and here you could see that she's starting to get a little bit of movement uh i think uh, the gains on the function are pretty modest and i don't wish to dwell on that but this was the only time we got a complete smile on her face her pain had gone completely she was sleeping well and she had started uh, changing her clothes on her own self her adls had come back significantly uh, uh, i don't think that pec major is working as a power arm but it's still early days yet 6 months is too early for such a person who suffered for 3 years without any form of function we've got rotation and that's purely probably because of uh, a lateralized implant i think rather than any soft tissue advantage here so this is just an option that we performed again purely for redeeming the patient from pain rather than giving them any form uh, movement and function but again i i think the take home has been that the greater tuberosity is not an easy thing to deal with uh, it must be fixed appropriately at the first instance uh, revision greater tuberosities are a disaster i've done a couple of reverse shoulders for isolated greater tuberosity fractures which went into non union for one year or so so i think that's like using a cannon to kill a rat so can can uh, my, yeah Can Roshan present his talk, please? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Can uh, you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. 
I'll try to get through it quick because I, I know we're uh, pressed for time. So I'll just briefly touch on my indications for uh, anatomic TSA versus reverse. Uh, let's see. I don't have any uh, disclosures other than uh, I trained with Dr. Frankel. So uh, we like to do the reverse shoulder. So over the last decade, the um, utilization of shoulder arthroplasty has increased pretty dramatically in the United States. It has increased uh, in, uh, significantly since the reverse was FDA approved. And you can see that there's actually been quite a bit of utilization of the reverse over the last decade. Uh, my indications to do a reverse, uh, the first five here are more absolute indications. So uh, cuff tear arthropathy, revision setting, uh, fracture setting that you cannot fix, inflammatory arthritis, or, or even a massive cuff tear. Uh, the next two are more relative indications. So uh, depending on the wear pattern, usually a B2, B3 glenoid, um, or an elderly patient with arthritis. I do check the uh, deltoid and everybody that I'm going to do a reverse on. If I have an MRI, I look for any fatty streaking in the deltoid just to make sure that uh, the cervical spine isn't involved. In whatever type of reverse you do, um, I do think you're not necessarily recreating the anatomy perfectly. So the left here is an inlay design. The right is an onlay design. And whatever you believe in, whichever design you believe in, um, if you look at the red X, that's the center of rotation. So you're not truly reproducing that in a, in a reverse. And the reason I bring up that point is you want to optimize the length tension relationship. And so my indication to move on to doing a total is that it's the most anatomic procedure that we can do. And so in a patient with OA who has an intact cuff and he's unresponsive here, she's unresponsive to conservative treatment. Um, I think that's my general indication. The things that I do worry about are subscap failure and glenoid loosening. Uh, whatever your technique is, I try to make sure I get a pretty sound subscap repair. And I think it is underestimated in the literature, the amount of subscap failure you do get. Here's a study that shows there is some um, de-innervation of the subscap post-op, which is actually a pretty high incidence. They say 30%. I think that in, in a setting where the tissue quality is poor, where you may have had a previous procedure uh, on your subscap in the setting of a post-traumatic uh, case, um, you may want to lean more towards a reverse, um, and you may have a more successful outcome if you do that, because um, it would avoid subscap failure. Um, glenoid failure is the other thing I worry about. The incidence is about 1% a year. And in a shoulder in which I don't feel like I can get good backside contact, um, when putting the glenoid component in, I'll lean more towards a reverse. There was a paper by um, Dr. Walsh that said that when you have a B2 glenoid, the reverse is probably the best way to balance it. I think in the advent of augments and over the last decade, people using augments more, I think that is a powerful tool. Uh, but if you can't balance it, I would do a reverse. This is just a study comparing total versus reverse. And although the indications for each procedure was different in this study, the complication rates are relatively similar. So I don't necessarily worry that a reverse has more complications than a total. I think the complications are different. Um, in doing a reverse in young patients, I have no problem, even if they're under 65, as long as they meet the indications. Uh, here's a study um, by the Mayo Group that didn't show, even though it's short-term data, it didn't show a difference in complications. Um, another study by the Campbell Clinic, Clinic Group that um, they studied reverses in young patients and found that um, people had actually better outcomes with a reverse so um, and faster recovery. So I think that if you're going to do a reverse, just like we kept the failure modes in mind for the total shoulder, keep in mind the failure modes and the problems associated with it and try to avoid them. And um, a couple of things to touch on when you're indicating people for a reverse. I think that there's a reliable outcome if you do it in the setting of a massive cuff tear with arthritis. I think you do have to be um, careful if you're doing it in the setting of just an isolated massive cuff tear, and we saw a case on that before. And I think that if they um, have full motion um, and preserve function, then I think even if they have a massive cuff tear, you should not do a reverse. So uh, just to, to recap, um, my indications for a total would be excellent cuff function, minimal glenoid deformity for a reverse, cuff tear arthropathy, uh, revision setting, fracture, um, inflammatory arthritis, massive cuff tear. Um, and 
you know, I think that in my mind, choosing the most durable option for the patient is the most important thing. So if they're above 60 and you can't balance the shoulder well, just consider uh, doing a reverse in, in, in my mind. That's all that I got. Thank you. Any any uh, questions, Ashish? You here? See, I think Roshan, that's been well put, and uh, I think the reverse has taken a lot of thunder out of the total. I think it requires a lot more skill to do a good anatomical. The problem is not with those very obvious cases where this one needs a reverse. There is no cuff, uh, and if everything is intact, you would do an anatomical. I think my biggest challenge is doing those gray areas where there may be a cuff, there may not be a cuff, or there may be an intact cuff, which may not function well. And those who are very stiff and contracted in internal rotation, giving them that full function is a very big challenge. I'm still a big proponent of anatomicals, uh, unlike Europe, which is heading completely out towards the reverse. But sometimes one tends to get it wrong especially in trauma. What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I would agree. I would have a low threshold to do a reverse at that setting. Um, I think that it, a reverse is more durable and uh, you have a more predictable outcome in that setting. That's right. I guess my kind of two cents on this is, you know, I think the obviously the reverse, the indication, the immediate indication is chronic rotator cuff arthropathy. And then the fastest growing indication after that is reverse for fracture. And then most recently over the last five years, the fastest growing indication is intact rotator cuff with glenohumeral arthritis. And that's kind of that gray area where we don't know um, in the thin cuff, lack of external rotation, bone deformity with arthritis and intact cuff where the reverse kind of plays in. And so kind of in my clinical practice, the way I kind of think about it is I'm always thinking about kind of the delta of the patient. And so what I mean by that is, you know, what the function of that patient is preoperatively, the age of the patient, the medical comorbidities, um, how much motion they have preoperatively. And then if they have good motion, good strength on cuff testing and arthritis and no significant deformity, that's a total for me every time. But I will tell you that in my practice, that pendulum's kind of switched to where if it's an older patient with not that great motion, with weakness on cuff testing, even if they don't have, a, uh, if, even if they have an intact cuff with plenohumeral arthritis, they're getting a reverse. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ashish, uh, do you want to show one or two cases and then? Yeah. Uh, does, uh, can I play uh, Roshan's case? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've got uh, Roshan and uh, Sri next. So I'll just share their screen. Yeah, do you want me to share my screen? Oh, you'll, you'll share it? I can share it for you. Just give me a cue. Sure, go ahead whenever you're ready. Sorry, let me switch this off first. Let me stop share here. Yeah, ready. Okay, go ahead. So, um, this is a case I did in fellowship, and uh, you can go to the next slide. So, a 49 year old male, he's right hand dominant. He has complaints of left shoulder pain, limited range of motion, has exhausted conservative treatment, and um, is debilitated because of his shoulder. Um, based on his x rays, he has glenohumeral osteoarthritis. And if you look at the axillary view, I would call that a B2 glenoid with posterior wear and subluxation. You could go to the next slide. We could show the CT. So um, I would say that, um, you know, just for the purposes of this case, you could say he's got about 22 degrees of retroversion and maybe 70 to 80 uh, percent posterior subluxation. And maybe I can ask the panel. Uh, you can play this, play the next video as well. That's his uh, external rotation motion. And, and I would just ask the panel. Um, what are the options um, for this uh, and how would you manage the deformity? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the part of this case that really is worrisome is kind of the lack of external rotation 
and then also the posterior subluxation in my mind's eye. And so really for this patient, it's either an anatomic or a reverse, obviously. So in that, if I'm doing anatomic, I'm doing posterior augmented glenoid component to try to um, recorrect the, the, the joint line uh, without significant eccentric reaming. Um, but my threshold to do a reverse, if this patient had poor function preoperatively, would be pretty low. So what, when you talk about uh, augmenting, would you put it where it lies in augment? Do you have a threshold to eccentrically ream um, in your practice? Yeah, it, so my goal is to take less than about two millimeters of bone um, if I'm trying to eccentrically ream. And so usually that corresponds to about 15 degrees of, um, of retroversion. And so I'm willing to put it in about 10, to 10 degrees of retroversion. And so if it's about 15 degrees, I will probably try to eccentrically ream versus if it's anything more than that, or even if it's at 15, I'll probably use an augmented implant. That way I don't have to take as much bone from the anterior uh, glenoid. How do you assess your balance intraoperatively once you're prepared your glenoid, you put your trial in? Um, how do you, number one, assess the balance of the backside contact of the glenoid and the balance of the shoulder? Yeah, so what I'm looking for is on the humeral head, I'm basically trying to replace just as much as I took off. Um, and then what I'm trying to recreate is... Uh, is essentially recreate the joint line. And so if, if, if I'm take if I'm putting an augmented implant, I'm trying to recreate the version to less than 10 degrees. Um, and so making sure that I put a trial in, making sure that when it, the trial is not rocking after I drill my peripheral pegs. Um, and then after, when I'm doing the humeral component, making sure I have 50% uh, translation, the humeral head is facing the glenoid the subscap is repairable onto uh, a reduced shoulder. Those are the three things that I'm looking for on my trial. Does the, uh, so how do you manage the subscap and does the lack of external rotation change your management of the subscap when you take it down? Yeah, you know, I think, I think I've gotten more and more aggressive about it. You know, this patient has a huge inferior glenoid spur. Um, you know, I think, I think while on the exam here, he looks like he's got not that much external rotation. I think after you take off that large inferior spur, after you mobilize along the rotator interval and take the subscap and release the uh, rotator interval all the way to the coracoid, you release the undersurface of the subscap off the middle glenohumeral ligament on the anterior capsule and anterior glenoid. I would think that you would probably be able to pull this subscap over and gain more excursion on it. Having said that, if I can't, this patient gets a reverse. So you're going to have both options available. You're going to go in with plan A to do an augmented glenoid and plan B, if it doesn't balance, you move to a reverse. Correct. Yeah. If I'm doing an anatomic, I always have the reverse stuff available because um, you don't know what you're going to get into, especially on this patient. So, so if I can mobilize the subscap, if I can uh, correct the joint line and have those things that I talked about when I'm trialing, um, then I'll do an anatomic. Otherwise I'll probably do a reverse. Anybody have uh, any different thoughts? Roshan, um, doing a standard reverse for an A type A glenoid should be straightforward, but uh, do you think uh, navigation will help uh, center the uh, augmented glenoid better? Because there are some reports where uh, post-op uh, CT scans, I think Juan Hu has one where there's a change and you aim for zero degrees glenoid version, but sometimes when you do a post-op CT scan, it may not be the same. And it could impact a B2 much more than a normal A glenoid, right? Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Um, I don't personally use a lot of navigation. I, I'm not that familiar with it. I do think it would be helpful. Um, if I'm gonna do a reverse, I would ask that, they, that I get about 50% contact of the base plate. If I can get at least 50%, I'm pretty comfortable putting it in neutral version. If I can't get 50%, then I actually would anavert it a bit to try to get uh, 50%. And I may use the humeral head as graft 
um, in that setting. If I can't get 50% and I've augmented with humeral head graft, then I'll try to use a bigger glenosphere to load share, um, kind of like you would in, in the setting of an augment to load share. Um, so I would try to use a bigger uh, glenosphere to, to load share and try to decrease the failure rate. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you could move to the next uh, slide. So uh, if you could play this video, so I tried to do the anatomic. Um, here I'm drilling the pegs for the anatomic. Um, after I um, do that, I'll put in the trial component here. And once I put it in, there's rocking of the trial component. So kind of um, what Sri was alluding to, um, I had a low threshold to do a reverse. So that was me putting in the base plate to um, do a reverse. That is a three-year uh, follow-up. Um, and the next slide just has his motion at that time. So, I mean, not long-term outcome, but three years and he's doing well at this point in time. Excellent. Super. Uh, the, the only thing I would say is, you know, look, that looked like the DGO glenoid. Um, you know, th that system doesn't have augments. Does that, yeah. that plays a role? You know? Um, it, yeah. it, of course, yeah, 100% plays a role. Um, in, in not doing um, an augmented glenoid. And that's the bias, right? I mean, that's the Frankel bias. So there's no secret about that. And uh, Raman, would you present your case and finish? Uh, can I get Sri? Um, I've got his present. Do you want to play it from there, Sri? Uh, I, I can. I can. Uh, I got, can, yeah. or uh, or we can conclude. I don't know if, uh, uh, if you guys have time. I'm happy to show, but you know, while, while you're bringing that up, if I just ask a question, like Roshan, for that. So I guess my my question is, is so that's young arthroplasty, right? So I think whether you do an anatomic or reverse, it's coming out at some point, right? That implant that's getting revised at some point, right? So because it's not going to last until he's seventy five or eighty. So I guess the, the question is, and especially with you know the colleagues from India on implant choices, right? You chose DJO. People use different implants. Does does the type of implant you choose? Do you take revisability into account, right, when you're doing young arthroplasty? Because right. I'm nobody famous, and I do a lot of revision reverses. So I think that either, even reverses, like they're not going to last forever. It's going to come out at some point. The anatomics can come out at some point. So how do you? How do you make those choices with young arthroplasty for knowing that he's going to get another arthroplasty? Right. So I think that's the part where um, only being a year out of training, I'm a little naive in that regard. However, I would say that I would much rather a durable reverse that would potentially give him 20 years, if, if we're lucky, to an anatomic which could fail in five to seven to 10 years. So it's a great point. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for you, but in my mind, at least from what I've seen and been taught, I would choose the more durable option. At least to your point, at least if you do an anatomic, you know the failure mechanism and you know what to do next. However, um, I think the more durable operation is the way to go at this point in my career. And maybe when I get to your stage, um, you know, five, seven, eight years in, I, I would change my thought process. Yeah. And I, my question is more so when, when the, con, when the comment was brought up about DJO is like, if you're going to, you do a reverse, which I think is fine. The type of reverse you, you choose can make a difference, right? Because certain, some reverses are more revisable than other reverses. So I think that that plays into account of, of what you're doing, especially if it's young arthroplasty. That, that was really my, my only point on that. So, so and I uh, think fees. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I would just bring up with what Hafiz said is that, I mean, as they go more, with more types of implants on the market, more modularity, less bone, shorter stems, I think it absolutely matters. So just out of curiosity, uh, Hafiz, what, what would you have, have done? 
Yeah, I probably would have done something similar to what you did. I mean, I think if I was going to do an anatomic, I would have you had an augment on that. Um, I think there are differences in terms of what a revisable reverse is. I think DJO is highly revisable, right? Because there's no in-vault fixation. There's no boss, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty sure. revisable display. So I, th I think I probably would have done something very similar. Um, I just think it matters that if you're going to use something else, um, maybe something with a large boss, in-vault fixation, in-growth post, that's hard to take out when he's 65. <laughs> so I think that, that there's, there's, there's a big difference in, in what you do. Um, I think a um, good point brought up by Hafiz and uh, Roshan as well, but this, um, I can say that some of these young patients where uh, I have a 10 degrees uh, retroversion, I have actually chosen to do a hemi and skip the glenoid if it's reasonably okay. Do a, uh, and uh, we've got almost 10 and 11 year results on these. Uh, good movement. Uh, they are wearing out their glenoid vault uh, significantly but they have no inclination to come in for reverse. So that also uh, is an option that should not be left alone. Okay. All right. It's good. All right. I'll kind of quickly go through my case here. So the first, this is a 45 year old chronic shoulder pain, fail extensive concerted measures, uses a walker to ambulate, has a history of LRDN lows, multiple shoulder dislocations in the past, uh, history of rheumatoid arthritis. You can look at her function, forward flexion of 90 degrees, abduction of 60 degrees, extra rotation of 30 degrees. These are her preoperative CT scans. So these are kind of the axial cuts. You can see the significant anterior glenoid bone loss, narrow vault, and she's five foot one inch um, and about 95 pounds. So again, the axials, these are the, uh, the coronals here. So pretty significant medialization here. A lot of bone loss, narrow vault, eccentric anterior bone loss. So Roshan, what are, what are you thinking about in this case? Are you thinking about anatomic, reverse, bone augment? Um, so I decided in like the first sentence of the case that I was doing a reverse and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of bone loss there. So that is what worries me the most. Um, you know, that's pretty severe retroversion B3 type glenoid, maybe C. And so I think that, um, based on that CT scan, um, I would try to do a reverse with standard instrumentation. You're definitely going to be getting maybe 50% backside contact at best. I would use a graft. I'd use a large glenosphere to load share. And, um, you know, if, if I didn't think in my preoperative planning that I could get at least 50%, um, I would even consider using the alternate spine line if I had to, but um, you, you may even have to consider something more, um, for augmented fixation. I don't know that you need to go to a VRS here, but if I couldn't get 50% contact and it was that severe, um, I would at least think about it. What about uh, what about the whole post versus screw? Uh, yeah, I don't, um, you know, obviously the system I use doesn't really have a post. I think the, the, there is some theory that if you use a post, you know, you may get more stability and ingrowth into the post. And um, I would just use a screw though. Yeah, you know, kind of my decision points for this were, you know, this patient has pretty significant anterior glenoid bone loss here. Um, and so my decision points are one, I'm either doing an anterior, you know, alternate or center line using a screw base plate construct, or I'm if I can get a post down this narrow vault, um, I'm going to use an augmented glenoid. And so what I did was I kind of preoperatively planned this. You can see this pretty significant anterior uh, glenoid deformity here, about 28 degrees of antiversion. This is just kind of me planning it. Um, and so, you know, when it's antiverted, it's almost easier to accept a little bit, uh, you know, pretty significant antiversion. So I'm willing to, in a reverse, accept 20 degrees of antiversion if I'm doing a total or reverse, sorry, a, a reverse on the glenosphere. And so, um, 
on this patient, uh, I kind of flipped the posterior augment and used an anterior glenoid uh, or used as an anterior glenoid. I was able to place it in a position where um, I basically have about four, uh, let's see here, about 15 degrees of, you'll see at the very end here, about 15 degrees of um, inversion and still get good coverage with a 36 glenosphere. Um, and then when you look at the axial cuts, you're able to see that I can, I, I felt that I could get a post in there without, with good circumferential bone coverage, uh, which again is not necessary, but I would, you know, that's the ideal case scenario. And this implant specifically, you can place non unlocking screws along the, the neck and uh, along the spine um, and then lock them. And so this is the implant that I chose to use. And so I, I got I a question about for, for you, inversion. And so I use GPS and intraoperative navigation for this. Um, you know, you can see how the vault is very narrow here. I felt like this would reproducibly for me, for this patient, a small vault, significant glenodeformity, get that post where I want it to be. Um, so use a small base plate, use GPS. And this is kind of what the x-rays look like post-operative. You can see that there's pretty significant you know, interior, interior in, uh, inclination, anterior uh, interversion, but if you kind of cover up this area here, you can see that this is exactly where you want your lens to uh, kind of be. And, uh, uh, and so these are my post-operative x-rays. These are kind of three month x-rays and um, she had about 140 degrees of forward flexion, 120 degrees of abduction, extra rotation of 40 degrees, clinically doing well using your walker. Um, so, what uh? Let's see here, anyone have any comments about this? Question for the for the rehab with the walker. I've always you know kind of been a little more hesitant maybe with the walker. Was that a concern? You know, did they start platform walker first, then you know, then kind of normal walker? What were your thoughts? Yeah, you know what I I really kind of played by. It really depends on the patient. If there's a patient that really needs their walker and this is a reverse for fracture, and um, I will let them use a platform walker right away. Uh, at the at the one week point. Now this patient was a forty you know nine year old uh, could use her other extremity and continue to be non weight bearing and use a uh, a walker with just the contralateral limb. And so in that patient, I'm making them non weight bearing for three months um, on that side, and then progressively allow them to use the walker. But functionally, if the patient needs a walker to ambulate, if it's an older patient that needs the extremity to use a platform walker, I'll let them use it right away. Hey, hey Shri, quick question. When you're using a post, do you feel that your ability to get a sense of your glenoid fixation is harder than if you use a screw or does it not really matter? Uh I mean, you know, when, you do, when you're using a screw, you're able to, especially if you have a uniblock base plate, not necessarily a central screw, but like a, like a DJO base plate, you're able to see the glenoid move and so you get the 0 0.0 fixation. Having said that, you know, with, with, with this specific system, you know, once you mount the, the peg in, you, you can't really move the base plate. Additionally, you're also putting non-locking screws all around and uh, using GPS to do, I use GPS to do that. And so I was able to get, you know, 38 to 42 millimeter screws in this. And so I felt pretty confident in my fixation. But I think in terms of time zero fixation, I think you definitely are able to see it, the whole scapula move when you use, you know, a uniblock screw base plate system. Excellent. Excellent, uh, Sri. Excellent cases. Uh, I think uh, Roman has to go to theater to do his case, uh, to operating. So he has to leave. Uh, so shall we conclude the orthoplasty session? Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all guys for excellent uh, cases, uh, talks and interactive discussion. Uh, next over to Dr. Pradab Kumar, is our current president of Shoulder Elbow Society of India to give the closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ram. Thank you. Oh. Uh, am I audible? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Can I can you uh, unshell yeah, your yeah. PowerPoint, Sri? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ram. Um, thank you, Vani, for your um, uh, opening remarks uh, um, uh, regarding our uh, tie up with the uh, Indian, Indian and American uh, counterparts. It's very important, but as you said, uh, uh, we need to share our views and you know the techniques and uh, other academic activities uh, and uh, also the um, cultural activities. Um, now, thank you all the presenters, uh, especially Hafiz and uh, uh, Anub and uh, Shirish uh, on your uh, uh, instability presentations, uh, Sundar, uh, Saurav and Ram as uh, usual for uh, excellent presentations on uh, the CUF. Um, and uh, Ashish and Roshan and uh, Sri for uh, your uh, arthroplasty sessions. Um, I, I think it's uh, very important that uh, we need to share our views and if it's, uh, it will be really helpful if we can get uh, uh, the CME programs, um, at least uh, three, four uh, CME programs a year uh, to exchange our views. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking the Indian fellows uh, for, uh, for a full training um, uh, from uh, US uh, for the ACS. Um, and uh, more importantly, I invite everyone, um, especially our American counterparts, uh, to the uh, biannual uh, Shoulder Elbow Society um, conference. Uh, this time it's going to be in Cochin, Kerala uh, on 28, 29, and 30th of October. Um, I, be, I welcome everyone uh, to be physically here. Uh, and at least uh, if you cannot do that, uh, uh, at least on online platform, with your valuable presentations uh, and uh, uh, if you can give the suggestions and uh, your topics, it will be very great. I will be very grateful. Uh, with that, I will conclude. Uh, uh, thank you. Session. Thank you, Ortho TV, Neeraj and Ashok for the live streaming so that this will be available in Ortho TV for everyone to view. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Roshan Sri, Saurabh. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.